Jack, we're still talking about uh, scholarship, and I want to uh, see if I mm -hmm. can focus you right now on the, the First Amendment okay. the scholarship uh, that you did, and then we'll, we'll move into the, the more recent uh, stuff. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, the, the first problem that um, arose in teaching the First Amendment is that in most First Amendment courses, you start off <clears throat> with uh, justification for the protection of speech. And in most case books, it's 10 pages, maybe 15 pages, just to introduce students to um, various ideas about the justification. Um, well, it was very, very unsatisfying <laughs> to me. Uh, there are a couple of case books um, more designed for seminars than for the basic course that, that do a better job of that. But um, gosh, just right off the bat, I said, oh, I'm going to have to try to figure this out. <clears throat> Why is it we protect speech to the extent that we do? Which in this country is very dramatic. We protect speech more than, I think it's fair to say any other country in the world. <clears throat> Certainly more than any of the European countries. Uh, including even the Scandinavian ones. Um, and as best I can tell, more than uh, any of the South American countries. Now outside of that, I don't know. Um, I, uh, I taught comparative free speech in a, uh, uh, a summer program um, for Stetson in Spain, Argentina, and uh, the like. So I, I had to do mm -hmm. some of that research. Why? Why do we protect speech to the extent that we do? Well, there are various theories. Now, it, it seemed to me that you needed at least some justification for the protection of speech. Um, even if you say, well, no you don't. It's there in the Constitution. You just do it. Well, those phrases don't apply themselves. They're just quick little <laughs> clauses. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you don't know what you're trying to accomplish interpreting those, even in, if you take uh, sort of a, uh, uh, a linguistic approach, meaning that uh, these words mean what they meant at the time that they were written and so forth and so on, that doesn't solve the puzzle. Or if you say it has something to do with the intentions of the drafters, that doesn't solve the problem. All of those are just other ways of talking about the tensions there. It's something as simple as what is speech. Right, I mean, exactly you, you, right. You have to go to what the purpose That's right. is. That's right, that's right. And you can look at the way the word was used, you can look at the intention of the authors and find that there's no real guidance on what they meant by speech, but it didn't occur to them that that was going to be a serious problem. And if it did, they left it vague. Um, that's pretty clear. The clearest thing is, let's leave this vague. Uh, it was being done under political pressure. It's a promise uh, Madison makes in order to get the Constitution passed. And uh, for the most part, they blew it off. Uh, if you read the records, the conversations about them are not serious. And what they are serious about is everything falling apart. <laughs> so there's a great deal of, ah, let's not talk about that. Let's just get this done so we can get on to real business. Uh, so it seemed to me that it, you uh, needed um, some sense, some um, uh, exploration of uh, justifications in order to make sense of it. And all the ones that I read, um, there was some truth to it. Uh, there was something of value. Uh, but there were problems with all of them. That's not just me. Everyone would pretty much say that. In fact, the introductory materials and all the case books I saw say, well, here are the various theories and the problems with all of them. Uh, so let's, the typical response to that was, well, let's just throw them all in there and let it go with that. And in fact, there's a famous Brandeis opinion. It's in uh, uh, White, uh, concurrence in White, um, in which he does pretty much that. This is at the beginning of, the, of our z uh, zealous protection of speech, when the court is deciding that that's the course that we are to take as a country, and true to who we are as a people, and so forth. 
he and Holmes are writing in concurrent the, uh, um, in the opinion. Now maybe it's Gitlo. Um, and he, he does what judges at the time did when they aren't sure how to talk about this. He offers a history, so a history of who we are as a people. And quite clear that this is a question then of our identity, that that's what we are trying to decide here, our identity as a people in the very particular context of the protection of speech in this factual situation, we're trying to decide who we are. So he goes through the history, not particularly well done, and uh, um, um, people would quarrel with it, but he's offering a narrative that, that was, could be persuasive to a lot. And then he gets to the crucial part of why, and he writes this most amazing paragraph that is one idea after another in rapid succession, separated by semicolons, which is the equivalent of his saying, I don't know how to say this. Uh, I know it. I know I'm right. He's, he's clear as can be. He knows he's right, but he doesn't know how to say this. Holmes, who offered the marketplace of ideas, later on says, I don't really know why we should protect speech to the extent that we do, uh, but I know it's right. So for them, it's almost as if this is a matter of a certain kind of judicial intuition mm -hmm. uh, about something that they can't articulate in a conceptual way. Uh, well, that was really very, very interesting to me. There was an article <coughs> by uh, Stanley Fish. Stanley Fish is um, uh, primarily uh, a scholar of Milton, but Stanley Fish is a very public um, scholar. Writes for the New York, has a column in the New York Times, has all, a huge number of books and articles. And he's very controversial. I got to know Stanley, too. He's a very controversial figure. Loves to pick fights with anybody. We had him here at the law school on two occasions. One time, Stanley Heyer was and Stanley Fish, and it was the dueling Stanleys, the Stanley Steamers, as they, um, that was that symposium. Um, and Stanley had written about, um, there is no way of justifying speech that any justification that you offer for the protection of speech will itself be used to restrict speech in a way that you want to prohibit. Now, no matter what the justification is, it's going to turn upon itself. And that it's completely unprincipled and protection of speech is just a matter of putting a hurdle in the way of government um, uh, being um, uh, too dictatorial, too controlling. Uh, he wouldn't even go so far as to say that that hurdle is for the purpose of protecting democratic conversation. He wouldn't do that. That sounds too much like a principle. Well, that didn't sound right to me, and so um, I wanted to write something about the justification of speech. Now, this will, <laughs> this will uh, uh, show you uh, the, uh, how wonderful our jobs are and what a luxury it is to be a professor. At the same time, <laughs> I had uh, literally fallen in love with the music of Brazil. Okay. I'd always liked it, um, samba. Not the dance, but the music samba. I'd always liked it, but it, it, I, it just, there was this one song by a Brazilian composer by the name of Chico Buarque. Um, it was called Calaste. And I listened to Calaste uh, over and over and over again. I had no idea what the words meant, but I knew that something terribly important was going on in that song. Again, as a matter of intuition, there's just something going on in that song um, that made it overwhelmingly appealing to me. I looked at all of his other stuff, and his other stuff was wonderful too, but I just kept coming back to that song. So uh, I said, well, I've got, I got to figure this out. Um, well, Kalatse 
in um, Portuguese, they speak Portuguese in Brazil, um, can mean two things. Slight difference in pronunciation that non-Brazilians would have a very hard time picking up, and they, sometimes even Brazil, uh, it gets lost. In one interpretation, it means chalice or cup. In the other interpretation, it means shut up. <laughs> And if you just slightly change the stay at the end, you've changed that meaning from okay. chalice to cup. A chalice is the chalice that's used in the Eucharist. That's the same word that they use for that. All right, so I found out that Chico Poit was um, writing that song during what the Brazilians call the years of lead. It was when the dictators took charge of their country. And uh, it was the odd time during the 60s where um, people were frightened, governments were frightened by kids, rebellious kids in this country and all over the world for some reason. But they were also frightened by communists and everyone was labeled as one if you uh, disagreed with the government's position. And this took its worst forms in the South American countries in Australia, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Argentina and in Brazil. Argentina worst of all, um, but also in Brazil. So people were being jailed, people were being killed. Um, country was uh, completely under the thumb of dictators. It was, uh, and what Chico was doing in that song was um, a, a peaceful form of rebellion that by playing on the difference in that word, he could write a song that was ostensibly about um, the church, religion, and the like. And then, I won't go through a detailed analysis of it, but by the way in which he handled the music and the way in which it was structured, it's suddenly the government saying, shut up to you, over and over and over again. <laughs> And the person that this is, uh, that, the, that the song is about, it's watching them become a thing, a breakdown of their humanity into a thing because the government is saying, shut up, over and over and over again. He got this by the censors, by using that little difference in the meaning of the word. It's absolutely brilliant. He then <clears throat> went on to write most of the songs of the revolution in uh, Brazil that freed them from the uh, dictatorship and each one of those uh, was done in a similar fashion. You would see towards the end you'd see 300,000 Brazilians marching through the streets singing uh, a pesar de você which means in spite of you and it became the anthem of the revolution. He writes it, it gets censored, he has to appear before the censor, th they always threaten to uh, exile him and uh, deport him, and uh, they did uh, for a three-year period that he was in Italy, and he came back. That happened to many people. Uh, they couldn't kill him because he was too, too loved. <coughs> um, so you see them, 300,000 Brazilians marching through the streets, singing the samba, a pesar de você, in spite of you. When he went before the censorship board, they said, no, you can't, we're not going to publish this song. I'm not going to let you release this song. And he said, why not? This is about uh, a girlfriend that I had that was making my life miserable. And what I'm saying is that I'm going to go ahead and live my life to the fullest in spite of you. That's all it means. And the censorship board accepted this. Uh, as it turns out, the, the guy that was interrogating him uh, had played on the Brazilian soccer team when they lost to Uruguay which was the most devastating event in Brazilian history. Pele, in the most recent edition of Time, says, and people gave him a hard time about this, he said, that did to Brazil what the death of John Kennedy did to the United States. Okay. <laughs> he was serious about that. Well, Chico used that on the censor. How can you censor me? You lost your <laughs> Uh, anyhow, so I just loved that story, 
And um, it was about censorship. It was about a way of addressing censorship. And I started examining Brazil, and I found that there were these two cultures, a culture of samba and a culture of what I call common sense, which was uh, really the, the culture of the dictatorship, for the dictatorship to the people at the time, made a great deal of common sense. Um, and that what he was doing is appealing <coughs> to the culture of samba in a way that would remind Brazilians of who they are, especially as Catholics. And it was a beautiful, beautiful thing to do. Uh, avoided a lot of violence and uh, the like. Okay, so I wanted to say, well now that says something about speech. And find in that, at the rock bottom of it, uh, what was it um, about speech in that context that could then address what Stanley Fish was talking about as speech, as our justification for speech lacking all principle and just being something that we do and so forth and so on. So I wrote uh, an article um, called Censoring Samba that went off in that direction. And essentially it said that speech is a, a self-justifying activity like play is. To ask someone, why do you play, makes no sense at all. <laughs> and to ask someone, why do you speak, why do you speak, why do you talk, makes no sense at all. We know that. We know that speech is self-justifying, and that is to say that it is part of our constitution. It what makes us human. And that's not a lack of principle, nor is it a principle that can easily turned upon itself in the way that Stanley was doing it. And uh, so it was a different form of justification for the protection of speech than I had seen in the literature, and that excited me. Mm -hmm. And during all that time, I got to research Samba and learn a little <laughs> Portuguese and deal with Brazilians. And the article was eventually, uh, thanks to David Ritchie, uh, uh, translated into uh, Portuguese and published in Brazil. And I got a lot of emails. And then I in also in this room and before a camera like that one did a presentation to I think it was 250 Brazilian judges um, about the protection of speech. And it was wonderful to be able to talk about what we do mm -hmm. and uh, to draw upon their own uh, culture mm -hmm. uh, in doing that. Uh, and I got a lot of nice, nice emails about that. That one was fun. Yeah. That one was great fun. So um, the other part, I was doing freedom of uh, religion as well, which tied in with my interest in theology. And um, uh, there, the question that is a question that's at the heart of the matter <coughs> with uh, freedom of religion, and it too is a why question. Why do we protect religion to the extent that we do? The typical way in which it arises is in the issue of accommodation. So when we pass a law and it has a negative impact upon speech, at one time, it must be substantial. Um, at one time we said, this is mostly uh, Justice Brennan, um, we said the Constitution requires that you accommodate uh, absent an almost po impossible showing, a strict scrutiny showing mm -hmm. by the government. That got overturned Employment Division versus Smith, um, Scalia opinion. No, the Constitution doesn't require accommodation. That didn't get overturned. Smith is still good law, but Smith only applied to federal laws. The feds then came in, passed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which returned law uh, in a couple of areas uh, to what it had been as a, uh, under the Constitution, but as a statutory matter, not a constitutional matter. And most states, two-thirds now, I think, did the same thing. They either did it as a state constitutional matter, which they were free to do, or they did it as a state legislative matter. All right. So we back almost to where we were, um, with a, a few exceptions, but we were pretty much back to where we were an accommodation being required. Well, in the academic literature, people had not been able to come up with a good answer to the why question 
of why do we give this special preference? Why do we protect religion that way? Uh, why not freedom of conscience that way? Why religion? And is there an answer that you can give to that question that is not itself a religious response? Well, it's, I, I looked over the literature, I've been away from that literature for a while now, so I don't know what's happened. I looked over the literature and they were just giving up. In fact, people who had been um, zealous advocates for um, accommodation, uh, Fred Geddix, a good friend who's a Mormon at uh, BYU and taught here at one time, he had given up, said, this is unfortunate, but we can't do this. There's no way to say what religion is in a way that is not itself religious that could possibly offer the special treatment. And I wanted to, uh, that was the question that grabbed me and that there were a lot of others in that one. And uh, I, I wanted to say that there's a democratic justification for it because uh, the, it's almost like there's a connection to what I was doing with the Brazilian thing that democracy is not self-limiting. Uh, the constitution that should limit democracy is a piece of paper uh, subject to interpretation, which many unfortunately now believe is also a political matter because we don't trust the law. We don't believe there is such a thing um, at that level. And um, so it's not self-limiting. And it really needs to be combined with a separate polity uh, uh, outside of itself in order to remain a democracy. And that there, there may be other polities that can do that, but it is primarily religion that offers an alternative to politics, at least in, in our world. Um, so there's a functional justification there too for, yeah, we protect religion because we need religion. I don't mean individuals need religion. I don't mean it's more important than anything else. I don't mean those claims. We need religion in order to know who we are as a democracy, uh, to know our own limits. So that, that's where I was going with uh, that. Um, so I guess uh, it's, there are many other things that we could talk about, especially in the religion stuff. But that's probably a hint as to what <coughs> enough of a hint as to what that was about. Okay, um, is this a good time to talk about what what your more recent sure. work has been sure. about, um, <coughs> and and what comes next too? Yeah, yeah. Um, I got asked. Joe Viney, who I mentioned a few times, wrote a book called From Newton's Sleep. And uh, Joe has a, you would have to call it a jurisprudence, although he doesn't write jurisprudential theory and the like. If you read uh, From Newton's Sleep, it's these little excerpts, these little short little pieces, not excerpts, short little pieces, uh, organized in a particular way, in a particular sequence, and each one uh, moving the reader in a certain direction. And it's moving the reader towards the reality of something called law. Uh, it's a cultural entity to be sure, but in Joe's mind something that is very real. Something that has uh, no physical existence outside of ourselves, but is nevertheless external to us and authoritative for us. The law, uh, in that sense, is not, there's nothing out there that you can point to and say that's the law. Everything that you might point to is simply evidence of it. And what Joe was doing in these short little uh, pieces is letting you see how ingrained that thinking was in your own thinking. Now for Joe, a central idea is that you pay attention to the law because in any text that we read, we assume that there's a mind behind it not the mind of the author, we're not talking about legislators, we're not talking about the drafters of the Constitution, but we pay attention to it because there, in these words there's an, a thought 
that we should pay attention to it because there is a mind behind this. He doesn't identify the mind. Um, Scalia, in a seminar with Joe, uh, at one point said, damn it, man, you're talking about God, just say it. <laughs> but he, it's not, and he misses the subtlety of uh, what Joe is, seeing, uh, is, uh, is saying. Um, he's not, he has no qualms about natural law, and he's a Catholic, but it's not a natural law claim. I just thought his ideas and the way in which he was doing it and the articles that, he's been here uh, before too, uh, that he was writing were just were, were breathtakingly beautiful and powerful in that way, and that he's right about that. Um, and that got me going. I was asked to do a, uh, a piece for a Festriff, which a Festriff is when scholars get together and write about the work of some scholar who is retiring. Or, or, uh, and uh, that gave me an opportunity to examine Joe's work very carefully and um, to write about it, and I did so in musical terms, because uh, I thought music would help with um, that explain that existence of something called the law that way. And I really would say that from that piece on, almost everything that I've been writing and things that I've been thinking about most recently um, followed from that piece. That uh, I'm still on that theme. Um, the uh, cultural reality of the law, which is to say that there are, we have modes of perception that um, match up with modes of reality that we don't typically recognize. Um, again, because we are so dominated by science as a model for our own thinking by physical existence and objective physical existence and the like, and uh, anything else is too uh, mysterious. Mm -hmm. um, so things like beauty, justice, law, and the like, eh, those are mere words that people use and uh, you know, show it to me, that kind of thing. Um, but that there is a reality to those cultural entities. It, it is, uh, there's a couple of philosophers, one of them Polanyi and the other uh, Wimsat, who would say that those realities are in many ways more real than the physical existence of uh, a desk <coughs> like this because they have much more explanatory power. They assume all of these physical, they arise out of these physicals, but they're a different mode of perception and explains more um, well, those ideas are very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And you can recognize and acknowledge that reality without answering the question where it came from. You can. You can. Um, like you can do it with music. I mean, people want to say where it came from, but you don't need to. Uh, it's there. It's a, it's a perception that we have, an experience that we have. Um, so you don't, it, it's like if I bump into a wall, I have an experience of bumping into the wall. <laughs> I don't need to ask the question of, why can't I pass through that wall? <laughs> you know? Can you say the same thing about mathematical truth? It's, oh, it, gosh, what a hard question. It's just as real as a physical <laughs> thing. Where did it come from? It is not, it's a separate yeah. question from whether it's real. It's actually something that uh, Joe is terribly interested in. <laughs> and uh, I think, yes. I think mathematical truths, too. And the interesting thing is that those truths become quite, um, lend, uh, lead to another, uh, tend to be there in another mode of perception as well. Um, what I'm uh, thinking about is um, uh, Gödel, the mathematician Gödel. And um, uh, Bertrand Russell and others, primarily Russell, 
tried to show that math was just a, it was a coherent language all unto its own um, and that we could draw upon math to then do analytical philosophy and so forth and so on. <laughs> and he failed. And he failed for a rather simple reason. Uh, it's that ma different levels of math, each one reflects back on themselves, and that creates a problem. It's like um, if I were to wear, uh, if, if you had a sign and the sign says, the statement on the other side, let me see if I can get this right, the statement on the other side is false. And the statement on the other side said, this statement is false. <laughs> and then it's this right. re circular reflecting back. He couldn't solve that problem as it applied to different levels of mathematics. And he eventually gave up. Well, Gödel proves in mathematical terms that that will always happen, that you can never escape that that math always be, ends up being open-ended and an ongoing inquiry uh, in ways we never thought. Um, and so it too um, points beyond itself, let's say that. And that's part of what Joe was uh, talking about. So yeah, anyhow, that got me interested in that. And getting interested in that means that you bump into uh, what in philosophy is called phenomenology. And it's a focus upon our experience of the thing itself, the phenomenon itself. Uh, in phenomenology, things that appear to us are, are the subject that we examine. And there are no mere appearances. They're all uh, serious. Um, and if you bump into phenomenology, you bump into Heidegger and uh, I, the, I'm not sure how I got started on Heidegger, but there was one article called The uh, Origin of a Work of Art. And it's a short little article. It's later Heidegger, a poetic Heidegger, uh, people might say, after what's called the turn. And uh, I read about four or five paragraphs of that. I, oh, my goodness. <laughs> It was like your eyes go like this. I did not know human beings were capable of thinking this way. Now, if you had done everything before him, Husserl was his uh, mentor and the founder of the school, and if you would read all the other stuff, then it might not have had that effect, but for me it was, mm -hmm. it was breathtaking. Um, and uh, much of what I've been doing since then has been um, influenced by that. I then, uh, a couple of more recent things, I did a, um, I didn't, this one I haven't published yet. I did, um, well, let me talk about one that was published. Under the influence of Heidegger, I did a piece with Linda Berger called The Law's Mystery, which was trying to find a way of evaluating judicial opinions almost in aesthetic terms. Uh, not aesthetics, it's just beauty or something peripheral to our lives, but it's something central and important. Uh, and uh, the, the way that, it may have been an unfortunate way, but the way in which I, uh, the word I chose to do that was inevitable. Is there something that seemed inevitable about the opinion? That was inevitable as a term of art used in the way that uh, critics, art critics, use inevitable. There is something about uh, Beethoven's writing in which each note seems inevitable. There is not a note that could have been there other than the one. You could not have known that in advance, and you can only know that when it's heard. But it's clear to you. It becomes clear to you. Um, um, <clears throat> and people talk about, especially Beethoven, in those terms that uh, there's a sense in which each note is necessary and follows. Um, could it have been other ways? Yes, it could. But it would not have that sense to it if it were. Poetry is like that uh, as well. And Harold Bloom, the critic, writes about poetry in a similar way. So I was wondering, can you think about the law that way? And can you think about opinions that way? 
and I did a little piece with Linda Berger, which I set up this theory. This was really fun to do. We were talking a great deal back and forth about this. Linda resisting it uh, completely. Um, so I said, let me set up the theory. And I did the first part of the article and set up the theory called The Law's Mystery. And you then apply it. Uh, together we'll pick an opinion. We picked the Cohen opinion, um, a Justice Harlan, second Justice Harlan. And you see if it worked. You apply it. Uh, so we wrote that article. It's called The Law's Mystery. And don't think I convinced Linda, but sure enough, it works in that opinion. <laughs> Remember when I was talking about uh, Har um, Holmes and Brandeis, and I said it's almost as if they have this judicial intuition mm -hmm. about it. Um, that's what pops up in that opinion. And it does look very much like a sudden intuition, uh, almost a revelation to him that this is who we are, this is how it has to be, there's something necessary about this. It is, now that I've seen it, inevitable. And um, I think there's something to that. The, uh, the term inevitable throws people and probably mm -hmm. should have said it in some other way, but that's how the art critics did it. I then, uh, this one is not published, it's called The Origin of an Opinion as a Work of Art. <laughs> Obviously borrowing from that article, that Heidegger article that had some influence on me. I've presented it twice, but I hadn't finished it up. I've gotten lazy about the footnoting. <laughs> <laughs> It's hard to get it back around to it. Uh, uh, well, Jack, at least theoretically, you're retired, but, it's, but lazy isn't a word that yeah, sounds no. like it would. Uh, it, it no, would, really, uh, it's just it's uh, got uh, three articles uh, done, but uh, that I haven't finished, and it does have something to do with retirement because I uh, there are no deadlines on those. <laughs> Turns out I need them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I each one has been presented, and each one I've gotten feedback on. And I've actually sent them out to some people. Uh, but they were just finished to the point where they were a right for presentation, but not right for publication. And I tend to want to move on to the next one before, right. I, before I finish it up. Um, there, are, there are several other pieces, recent other pieces. One was a festival for Jim White, James Boyd White. And I tried to show that his entire life and all of his work <laughs> has been an attempt to speak in a religious voice in a secular society. And um, Jim said he had never thought of himself that way, but that um, after, afterwards he thought that was probably right. Um, well, I want to ask you just a couple of more questions on the scholarship front. And one of them comes from our friend Mark Jones. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that he suggested that um, I ask you um, is, is this. He said he, he, he wrote to me that, you know, you, Jack, have, have written uh, from so many different perspectives, have drawn on so many different other fields, uh, you know, music, phenomenology, you know, philosophy, you know, right. on and on and on. He describes that as intellectual restlessness. Oh, sure. Is that, is that a fair characterization of that? Yeah, no, I, that's, uh, that is fair, and I'm stuck in it uh, right now, because um, um, the last piece that I presented um, was on uh, rhetoric, and I wondered if, if the law was as I had said it was, and if there were, you, you know, ideally, as a uh, commendatory definition of uh, the um, uh, judicial decision making, we try to set up the judge so that the judge or justice has no resources <laughs> for um, deciding the dispute. We put everything in conflict and say, you're a judge, you can't, you shouldn't be looking at things outside of, it should be the law that tells you. And we're going to make that impossible by pressing the words that, which we express the law to the point of what Jim White would call the edge of meaning, where they're just about to fall apart. Where when you say reasonable person, you suddenly discover, I don't have any idea what that means. <laughs> um, and we put them to that point and say, decide. Um, and it, it 
seems, the, the word intuition keeps coming back, it seems as if we're calling upon an intuition, but not an intuition that is internal and something privately held, um, not that, but something that arises from the factual situation itself. Mm -hmm. When you say, when the judge says, aha, well now I know what I'm going to do. I know how to go on here. That was like, let me get back to Beethoven, that um, he's working on the Ninth Symphony and he doesn't have the Ode to Joy melody. Um, and he works for years and years trying to figure out what the Ode to Joy melody is uh, to complete this work. This dramatically innovative work, first time vocals had been used in the symphony in this way and so forth and so on. And at, at the point, at one point, he writes it and he says in the margin, it's been found, right? Not, I found it, <laughs> or I created this, or I wrote this, but it's been found, that it came to him. That's how artists describe their work all the time. Mm -hmm. it, it came to me. This character that I'm writing about, I didn't know what he was going to do next. Right. He told me. Um, it, and, uh, that, that is so common. Uh, my son's a composer, as you know, and it's especially common among composers where you don't feel like you wrote the song. It wrote you, in a sense. Um, mm -hmm. It wrote itself. Anciently, we would say the muse. Um, we still have that experience over and over again, and it's almost as if the judges, the good ones, ideally, um, have that experience. If that is true, what happens to rhetoric and persuasion? You have to think about those differently. How do you persuade, the way I put it in the last talk was, how do you beckon the muse on behalf of another person? <laughs> so it, I thought you've got to think about persuasion in a different way than we've been thinking about it. And uh, so that was the last presentation I did. And the reason we're telling you all of that is that after I finished it, it went over well, people were interested in it. There was especially a woman in Spain who uh, ended up using it uh, in a presentation that she was giving over there, and that was really rewarding. Um, but I thought, I think I'm getting stuck. I think I am ended up in the last few articles saying the same thing too often, generally. I mean, a great deal of differences with him, but, but generally, I, I think I'm stuck. And it's, it's time to move on. It's that, mm -hmm. it's, uh, there's something else that um, is uh, awaiting uh, mm -hmm. attention and I'm missing out on it. So I think that's what Mark is talking mm -hmm. about. You know, it, it strikes me hearing you describe that, that in some sense that comes from um, how the, the practice of being a scholar works with you. That it, it is part of that, that restlessness, that curiosity, that drive to go on to the next thing. It's not how many publications you have. It's not how many citations you get. There's no. plenty of that in our profession. Yeah. But that's not what drives you to write or has ever driven you to no, write. It, no, it's things that I want to try to figure out. And uh, I can't figure things out without writing about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's right. I didn't, I never tried, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not saying this is a good thing. But I never played the publication game of trying to get things placed in the best. Mm -hmm. it, it, my rule was, I'm going to send these out. And uh, the, the first one they accepted, that's the one I'm taking, because I'm just, I don't want to play the game. Right. Um, that, wasn't the, that wasn't the point. Right. Now, why not say that's a good thing? Um, because in some ways, it's a disservice to your own institution that thrives on <laughs> those sort of recognition. Well, of course, that, that brings me to a question I told you I wanted to make sure I asked you, and that is, um, do you, and, and of course Mark suggested this as well, do you have any advice for young scholars just starting out? Well, um, I tell you what worked, this is uh, <clears throat> something that I thought about. <clears throat> um, I guess it was about a week ago, because I was thinking back on when we did the last one of these. Um, and it really 
comes back uh, to Carl Warden, Dean Warden. Mm -hmm. I was his associate dean. And I, it didn't register with me at the time, um, but it ended up being true for me. And so I'm a young scholar. I've been director of the clinic for about three years, and Carl comes down and says, Jack, I want you to be associate dean. And, no, I don't want to do this. I can't. <laughs> you know, faculty's not going to like it. I'm a clinician, and there was a division throughout legal education, less so here, but still here. They're not going to like it, and so forth and so on. And Carl, I'm, I'm not going to wear uh, a tie when I go to the grocery store. <laughs> That's how I was thinking in terms of I don't want to be that person. Um, but uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, but you couldn't say no to Carl. He was too wonderful a man. So I uh, took the job, and we chatted, and we chatted about an awful lot of things, and started talking about scholarship. And he said, you really need to find someone good to argue with. That <clears throat> that's the key. Find someone you respect and disagree with mm -hmm. and go after them. Well, it just occurred to me the other day, that's exactly what I've done. Um, almost everyone that I've mentioned who was influential over me, I've disagreed with, often um, in writing. So Tom Schaefer. Tom and uh, Bob Cochran, a professor out of Pepperdine, wrote a book about counseling that turns upon uh, the value of friendship. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't like it. I didn't think it worked. And so I wrote an article that essentially said, every single thing that you say about friendship in there, including all the examples, is wrong. It gets it wrong. You misunderstood Aristotelian friendship. Put that aside. Let's just look at these examples. Now I wish I'd done it better. I see. I wish I'd just started with the examples and showed them why each one was a questionable result. Mm -hmm. Why friendship doesn't work in on your own terms it doesn't work. What did Tom do? Tom publishes a large part of that article in the teaching manual for the book. <laughs> and says, um, you, you should take into consideration what Jack is saying here. Mm -hmm. And uh, essentially, it might be right. I don't know. <laughs> they then, the two of them, then wrote an article in response mm -hmm. and set out theirs, and uh, we let it go with that. But so this is a guy that meant so much to me. No, you're wrong. Right. Stanley, I've already mentioned, it was an attack on <laughs> his understanding of Albert Speer. Saying, no, you got this wrong. Um, recently, uh, Jim White, who taught me how to read cases I want to, and enjoy doing so, <laughs> um, I was doing a book review for a New Zealand scholar whose work is based on White's work, a delightful man, uh, Richard Dawson, I got to know and friends with. Um, and in part of the review said, uh, here's why White has gone astray and led Richard too. Not in any nasty way, sure. just, uh, and uh, so I, every, uh, well, not every, uh, uh, never said anything, uh, uh, Joe Vine and I think so much alike that uh, I don't know that I could separate myself <laughs> um, from him to find something uh, to write about. But each one of those was uh, uh, just, pressing me to take, to find someone whose work I admired, had been important to me, and then see what they might have gotten wrong. That that ends up being then central. Mm -hmm. And actually, it goes back to something Schaefer uh, wrote about. He was doing Atticus Finch. Everybody does Atticus Finch at some point. And Schaefer is a great admirer of Atticus Finch, but he said because he's an admirer of Atticus Finch, he wants to find his flaws, and that you learn more about ethics from the flaws of those you admire than mm -hmm. in any other way. And so, I don't want to say that there were flaws, but they were just uh, in any of those people. They weren't flaws; they were just differences, and allowed me to have thoughts of my own. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's an analogy there. What we were talking about earlier with games—that 
in this uh, the game of scholarly production, you need a worthy opponent. Uh, you, know, oh. you, you, you know, you need the cooperation of having the best people to test your your minds against. I think that's right. Yeah, I think that's right. I hadn't thought about it, made that connection, but I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. So your your advice to our young colleagues upstairs would be find somebody you admire and disagree with them. Yes. Yeah. And find out what it is that you have to say about what they have said. Mm -hmm. that's, um, yeah. That's great advice. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we take uh, a break, take, take a break uh, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about uh, teaching and, and some other things okay. that we need, we need to cover. Okay. Great. Yeah.